Okay. Okay, class, we're going to resume now with the second portion of our time today, and we're going to turn to 2 Peter. So if you would, open your Bible now to 2 Peter. We're going to address this book for uh, a period of time here and answer the questions of um, introduction as we regularly do. First of all, we deal with the matter of author. And we've already noted, because we read verse 1 already, that the author designates himself as Simon Peter, using two names. Furthermore, he describes himself as servant and apostle. And we made mention of this already. And the fact that Peter here describes himself as a servant, a doulos, makes him comparable to the book of Jude and the book of James, where those other authors also describe themselves as a servant. Uh, for Peter as an apostle, we can compare that with his first letter, where he describes himself also as an apostle. So uh, again, the claim that we had at the very beginning of our time is that Peter does not resort to making high and mighty claims for himself. He wants to see himself in more humble terms, like the humble term of a doulos or a servant. So the apostolic authorship of this book, however, or its authenticity, as we might describe this matter, uh, of this letter is widely disputed. Okay, so there are lots of, of scholars in the world today that, that believe that this is not actually written by Peter. And so the authenticity or apostolic authorship is disputed. And if you want to get into some of the arguments for and against that, I would refer you to Carson and Moo, a book that you'll be reading uh, and a chapter you'll be reading as an assignment this week. So despite the fact that there are scholars who doubt this, and they have some reasons for it, yet the author claims to be among the eyewitnesses of Jesus' majesty, which was observed as part of Jesus' transfiguration. So look at chapter 1 in verse 16. This author, if it's not Peter, is making a claim for himself that surely sounds like Peter. Chapter 1, verse 16, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Now that surely sounds like Peter's own account of the Mount of Transfiguration that we read about in, let's say, Mark chapter 9. And the author here claims to be an eyewitness. So either the liar that wrote this book claiming to be Peter was a good liar, a consistent liar, or it's just Peter himself who's writing this letter. So the author claims to be among the eyewitnesses to Jesus' majesty that occurred during the transfiguration. And I've given you the passages in the Gospels in which the transfiguration of Jesus is described. Um, in addition, the author sees himself nearing the end of his life. In chapter 1, verse 14, just the... Uh, in 15, the two verses prior to where we just read, we find the author saying this, uh, I know that I will soon put it aside, that is, his life, his body, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will make uh, every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So his departure there seems to be a reference to his uh, soon death. Uh, the author knows Paul in his letters and considers Paul, Paul a brother in the faith, according to chapter 3. Uh, the style of writing in Greek is different in this letter 
from what we find in First Peter. But as we noted, we're told that Silas was a co-author of First Peter, and that could account for the difference in style between the first letter of Peter and the second letter of Peter. The author uh, of this document uses the first person singular regularly. So those are instances in which the writer says I or me or my. The author uses the first person singular repeatedly in verses 12 to 15. And so we see here in verse 12, so I will always remind you of these things. Uh, verse 13, I think it is right. Uh, verse 14, I know, I will. Those are the examples of the use of the first person. But we also see it in chapter 3. Later, it's not just at the beginning. Chapter 3, verse 1, dear friends, this is now my, there's a first person pronoun, second letter to you. I have written both of them as a reminder to stimulate to wholesome thinking. So it's not just in chapter one. And again, if somebody is falsely writing this as if he were Peter, he's doing a good job here at masquerading himself as Peter. In addition, he uses the first person. So it's really just better and simpler and consistent with our doctrine of scripture to believe that the scripture is inspired, therefore it's truthful. And when the author says that he's Simon Peter, it's because the author was Simon Peter. And critical scholars can take different views and argue different points if they want. But I think that for most of us who are involved in church ministry, we will stand with the traditional identification of the author, which is none other than Simon Peter. We move on to the matter of recipients. And it appears that here again, we have a general address. If we go back to chapter one, verse one, we see that it's not as highly specific as first Peter, but yet it does seem to suggest a general audience. Chapter one, verse one, to those, I'm looking at chapter one, verse one B, to those who through the righteousness of our God and savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. So there you don't have any geographic specifications like Galatian, Cappadocia, and so forth. What you have here is just a, a general letter to those who have received a faith as precious as ours. But we also have in chapter 3, verse 1, what we mentioned just a few minutes ago, that the writer talks about this being his second letter and that it's addressed to his beloved, to his beloved and this implies that it's the same general audience as the first letter. So it could quite likely be Christians scattered over a number of different Roman provinces, possibly provinces in Asia, like First Peter. So that's about all we can say about the recipients. The date, uh, as the second letter of Peter, Second Peter must come after First Peter, which must may be dated around AD 60 to 65. If that's the case, 2 Peter would be written after 1 Peter, but before Peter's death, which was around AD 65. Perhaps this document was written after Jude, if it was dependent upon Jude, as some scholars believe it is. Um, so you'll read more about that in Carson and Moo, the theory that Second Peter depends upon Jude, and this person pretending to be Peter uh, got a hold of the book of Jude and then revised it and expanded it and um, made his composition one that pretended to be Peter. So uh, I'll let you read about that in Carson and Moo. I don't think that we're going to affirm that. Uh, I certainly wouldn't say that from the pulpit to any congregation that I was preaching to. I would preach this as the second letter of the Apostle Peter and stick to the traditional identification. But it's okay for us to talk about critical theories and what critical scholars say. This is a master's degree class. Not everything that we talk about here 
will be immediately transferable into pastoral ministry. Um, we have somewhat of an obligation to be at least aware of some of the things that are going on at the cutting edge of New Testament studies, simply because this is a masteral level class. It's not an indoctrination class. It's not a catechism class. It's a class that helps people at the master's level to kind of have a feel for what's going on in the field, but also to have some pretty good reasons for how to preach and what to say about these books when we do preach these books in our church, in our churches. So as the second letter, it must uh, come after First Peter. So it's probably written somewhere in the mid 60s, shortly after First Peter, but we can't say much more about it than that. What about the providence? Well, there's no evidence in side the contents of second peter so we have to say that it's unspecified but it's possibly from the same place as first peter and that we've identified as rome uh, next what's the purpose of the letter number two from peter <clears throat> well the author prays that grace and peace be yours in abundance through knowledge of god and of our lord jesus jesus our lord and he desires that they will never stumble, according to chapter 1, verses 2 and 10. So it appears that when he wants them to have knowledge, then it has to do with their heads. So there's doctrine involved to some degree. But when he goes on to say that his desire is that they never stumble, then you get practical matters. You get ethics, morality, and behavior. And that's what Paul and others would call righteousness in the Jewish context. Righteousness is good behavior, proper behavior, behavior conforming to the law of God, and so forth. And when you follow that, you never stumble. When you're disobedient, when you're unfaithful, then you stumble. So again, this is pretty Jewish in the way it perceives the obligations of the followers of Jesus. This author exhorts his readers, saying, therefore, be on guard, grow in grace and knowledge. And <clears throat> what we have here when it says be on guard and grow, these are two imperative verbs that appear in chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. So it appears that this letter has a similar purpose of exhorting the readers to be the kind of people that Christians are supposed to be. <clears throat> we see the word therefore, and these two imperatives together state the summary purpose of the letter, and that is the readers are supposed to guard themselves and also grow in their faith. In addition, as a, another possible purpose of this letter, the author writes to warn them about cleverly invented stories and heresies of false teachers. He writes to warn the readers about scoffers and lawless men who will come. He writes to make reminders about and stimulate the readers to wholesome thinking by recall of the prophet's words and the apostles' commands. So we have here a pretty practical uh, letter. It really seems to have more concerned about uh, uh, behavior than it does with developing a very complicated doctrines and so forth. It is concerned about false teachers, and so we have acknowledged that. But it's very Jewish in the sense that it really is concerned about the way the followers of Jesus behave. <clears throat> okay, so there we've covered the various questions of introduction concerning author, recipients, date, providence, purposes for this document. Any discussion or question pertaining to those questions of introduction? <clears throat> okay, the section on the message of Second Peter is a little bit shorter than the discussion of First Peter's message, and that's reasonable because Second Peter is a much shorter document with only three chapters. 
And I'm going to lead you, uh, leave you to read through this material to get its, um, its basic content. But there is some discussion about continuity between the old and the new messages, the nature of the kingdom of God, uh, Christology, and then something about the false teachers, then teachings about the second coming of Jesus, um, uh, and also a particular discussion of the issue of the last days, um, which is a fairly unique element of Second Peter. Yes, go ahead. Excuse me, sir. Um, uh -huh. Question about uh, the author or authorship of First and Second Peter. Uh, if First Peter was written by Silas and Second Peter is assumed to be Peter himself, are there any other writings or uh, proof that Second Peter is written by Peter? Uh, compare like uh, to compare with Second Peter. Uh, the only other letter you can compare with Second Peter is Jude. And um, we'll get to that in a little while. But you'll read in Carson and Moo about how some of the critical scholars believe that 2 Peter is basically an expanded and revised version of Jude, but sent out as if Peter had composed it. <clears throat> I don't find that persuasive, neither do Carson and Moo find that persuasive. But there, that's the only other example of a, of a letter like Second Peter. Okay, sir. You want to ask a follow-up question to that? Um, in comparison, First Peter, sir, if if Silas wrote it in comparison to Paul's writing style, how how does it compare to? To Paul's writing style if Silas wrote first Peter. Yeah. Uh, of course, we've got 13 letters from Paul, and they also manifest some differences one to another. Um, for instance, 2 Corinthians is much more difficult to read than 1 Corinthians. Um, the pastoral epistles generally are harder to read than the earlier epistles of Paul. So uh, there are variations among the letters of Paul, so we shouldn't be that surprised if there's a variation between First and Second Peter and their composition. In other words, their use of Greek language. And Paul tells us on a number of occasions that he's used the secretary, and a couple of instances we know who that is. In the case of First Peter, Peter tells us it's Silas. In 2 Peter, he does not tell us if he uses anyone and uh, certainly not who it is. So in terms of some of the arguments against the authenticity of 2 Peter would have to do with language observations. But what I've been saying all along is that by the use of secretaries or what we call the amanuensis, you can't immediately dismiss as authentic a letter just because some of the Greek grammar or the Greek syntax or the Greek vocabulary is different from other letters by the same author. Um, so First Peter is tricky to read, it, and Second Peter is also compared to some of the other letters of Paul, but <clears throat> The fact that Silas is used in 1 Peter, I don't see any natural or necessary correlation between having Silas, a companion of Paul, write 1 Peter that would make it similar to any of the earlier writings of Paul that may have used Silas as a secretary. That just We don't know, except for 1 and 2 Thessalonians, that Silas was involved in any of the Pauline letters. And certainly, First and Second Thessalonians are much easier to read than First Peter. I think you, sir. Sure. Okay. The last element of the theology or the message is ethics, and you'll see that is number seven that appears on 
page number five. So I really encourage you when I give you these handouts to uh, read over all of the material on your own after I've talked through them a little bit, but especially give good attention to reading and comprehending the discussion of the message of each of these letters. Like I've said, when I talk about message, I'm really talking about issues of biblical theology, or in this case, Petrine theology, the theology of Second Peter, uh, as we see it contained in this particular document. So first and second Peter, we see as general epistles, and general epistles generally have a very Jewish flavor to them. And that's true of both of the letters by Peter. Okay, any other questions or discussions concerning first and second Peter before we move on to Jude? All right, if you would get your handout on the letter to Jude or letter of Jude, sorry, we will deal with the basic questions of introduction, um, which is our, our normal procedure. <clears throat> and find the book of Jude in your Bible, which is uh, at the very end, it's the book that appears right before Revelation. So it follows the uh, letters of John. Okay, for Jude, what do we know about the author from this document? Well, it gives us, again, the name of Jude at the beginning. And because of our doctrine of inspiration, we take that seriously, even when liberal scholars may doubt that. So Jude, in Greek, is Judas, and he describes himself as a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. So notice this. This James is no doubt the one who is the half-brother of Jesus. And so this Judas, or Judas, would be another half-brother of James. And we see that Judas is given as the name of a younger half-brother of Jesus. And we see that in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. And we notice humility as he begins this document. This author does not claim that he's the brother of Jesus. And that's the same thing that we see James doing, who is the other half-brother of Jesus. Like Peter, these authors demonstrate their humility. And of course, that's necessary when somebody describes himself as a servant. So he doesn't describe himself as a kurios, which is the Greek word for Lord or Master. He uses the opposite term. He uses the term doulos, servant, to, to describe himself. <clears throat> and he humbly relates himself to James. He doesn't relate himself to Jesus, whom he could have called as his relative, but he doesn't. So, <clears throat> That's what little bit we can say about this author. We move on to the topic of recipients and the destination. We read in the first verse, the recipients, to those who have been called, who are loved by God, the Father, and kept by Jesus Christ. So we don't get any names of people. We don't get any titles of people. We do not get any geographical statements about where the recipients are. It is just a very general discussion. It's just a very general way of referring to these people. Those who have been called, loved by God, kept by Jesus. It's really to any Christian at all who might stumble upon this letter and read it or have it read to him. So again, this is why it's a general epistle. So to those who have been called, and notice this, this reference to calling here. That's another theme that we actually get in 1 Peter to, to quite a, an extent, this idea that those who belong to Jesus have been called into that status. <clears throat> in addition, 
we see here at the beginning of Judas, uh, Jude, the, the called have been loved by God the Father. And what you wouldn't see about this until you read it in Greek is that this uh, action translated as have been called really translates a Greek participle, which is a perfect participle. Um, and so let me explain a little bit about what it means to be a perfect tense in the Greek language. Greek has four different past tense verbs. Uh, the first tense is the imperfect verb, which usually will describe an ongoing or continuous action in the past. The second kind of verb is an aorist verb, which describes a simple action in the past without reference to it being ongoing or continuous and without reference necessarily to a particular present state of affairs because that action happened. By contrast, then, we get to the third type of verb, which is a perfect tense verb. A perfect tense verb is kind of a compound action. There are two aspects of the action. A perfect tense verb describes a past action that's completed. Secondly, it describes, as a result of that completed action, a state of reality in the present time that exists because of the past action. And so this is a verb that can be called a state of verb, a past action that produces a state of affairs that's true in the present time. So it's a compound action. And that is the nature of this verb that we read here, the called have been loved by God. And so the implication of this grammar is that God had done something in the past to establish his love and that that love continues on. It has been maintained and it is still true constantly in the present as Jude writes this letter. So he perceives the audience as people who have gotten into the love of God and they still have the love of God as a characteristic of their lives. That's the significance of the perfect participle that appears here in the address of this letter. So in addition, not only are they loved by God, but they have been kept by Jesus Christ. And that action described here in English as have been kept, that turns out to be in Greek, the original language, another perfect tense participle, meaning that something in the past happened to put them in Christ Jesus. And that action continues on until the present time. So as they read this document, they are still kept by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so these tandem perfect tense participles are really kind of emphatic that they enjoy the love of God and they enjoy the status of being kept. And it is a result of what God had previously done. Now they enjoy it in the present. So let me pause and ask if you've got any question about this explanation of, of the use of the perfect tense participle two times in chapter one, verse one B. Any questions that clear as mud? Say, no, I don't understand what the perfect tense is about. Mm. Or to be serious, uh, you want to ask any questions about it. So they've been called, they've been loved, and they've been kept. They've been called, they've been loved, and they've been kept by Jesus. So in addition, in verses 3, 17, and 20, the recipients are described as dear friends or beloved. The Greek word there is agapetoi, which is a common word in the New Testament to describe people who are loved by someone else. And so they're loved people, which reinforces, again, the love of God the Father. 
that's talked about in verse one. So the audience or the recipients amount to a group of believers who gather together for the Lord's Supper or what we call the love feasts or what this document calls the love feasts. Look in verse 12 here. <clears throat> He's talking about false teachers and something that they do. These men, these false teachers, are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. So what we see here is that these false teachers are blemishes, not good things. They're imperfections at your love feasts. This term love feasts, well, that happens to be part of the community meal that the early church celebrated and participated in when they gathered together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, most Baptist churches do not have a love feast because on the first Sunday of the month when they have the Lord's Supper, it is something that's added on to the Sunday morning worship service. And so they participate by distributing the bread and the cup. And there is a ceremony that is uh, enacted to remind people of what they're doing when they take the Lord's Supper. And usually when that's over, the service is over and people go home. Well, in the first century, it seems like the Lord's Supper was a lot longer than that because the Lord's Supper could involve foot washing, following what Jesus did as an example to his disciples in John chapter 13, where they were gathered for the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper that becomes the Lord's Supper, and they wash, uh, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. But they also have a Passover meal that was celebrated in that first uh, Lord's Supper. So the church then, in years following, kind of duplicates that and includes, in conjunction with the Lord's Supper, a community meal, and that was called the Love Feast. That's what we see here in the book of Jude, referred to in verse 12. So the uh, there are a group of believers who meet together for the love feast that's part of the Lord's Supper. Any question about that, that little observation about the implications of the love feasts for the audience or the recipients? Any question about that? Have you heard of that before? The love feast, the community meal that went along with the Lord's Supper. Paul actually talks about that in 1 Corinthians 11, when he talks about the church coming together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and some people take it in an unworthy manner. Some people were eating all the food, and other people were getting drunk as part of the, the love feast. That's what he's talking about there. Okay, well then, let's go on to date. Uh, what's the date of this document? Well, it's within the lifetime of Jude probably in the mid-60s. So Jude would be, oh, maybe five, ten years younger than Jesus. Uh, if Jesus had not died by this time, Jesus would be pushing 70 years old, around AD 65. And so Jude would be probably a little, a little bit younger than that. How much younger, we don't know. But... Um, could be as little as two years. It could be as much as maybe 10 years. Um, so within the lifetime of Jude, probably in the mid-60s, like the other documents that we've been looking at. Uh, some scholars believe Second Peter depends upon Jude. If so, Jude was written before Second Peter, which is not a great big problem if that's the case. <clears throat> But uh, there's no need to speculate that Jude is the source of 2 Peter's content for those of us who have a high view of Scripture. Providence is the next issue. That, too, is unspecified, and therefore it's unknown. We don't know where these people were. 
we don't have an idea where Jude was when he wrote this. <clears throat> so not even any slight hints that Jude is in Rome. It's possible, but we just don't have any evidence to draw upon to establish this. Last question of introduction is the purpose of this document. It appears that Jude was written to encourage readers to contend for the faith that was once entrusted to the saints. I'd like you to look at verse 3, and let's read that verse in its context. So after the greeting and the prayer, he says, Dear friends, in other words, beloved ones, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once delivered, once delivered for all entrusted to the saints. So this term faith here is just a shorthand way of referring to Christian teaching or Christian doctrine, the faith. It was once for all handed over. It was once for all entrusted to the saints. And so the idea here is that the doctrine that is really critical or crucial must precede the, the book of Jude, and that it indeed did precede the book of Jude in the first three decades of the church's history. And what the audience here is obligated to do is to accept that doctrine and to communicate it or transfer it to the next generation. And so they are to um, contend for the faith. That is that they need to work hard, they need to struggle for, they need to defend and preserve this faith, and that it had been once for all entrusted to the saints. When you have that kind of faith, you really prohibit or preclude any kind of development. That is that the Christian doctrine must be adjusted in each generation for some reason, um, so that we have 20th century Christianity that's widely different from first century Christian Christianity or Christian doctrine. No, it's the first deposit of doctrine in the first century that needs to be preserved and maintained and practiced throughout all history. We don't modify it so as to be different in successive or subsequent generations. We contend for it, we try to preserve it, we try to keep it pure, we pass it on to each generation. And sure. uh, that, yeah, go question, ahead. Uh, question about that, sir. Uh, would this be, would this qualify a verbal or um, uh, uh, doctrinal statement that was not written but just passed down verbally because the like the apostles creed was written or formulated third century or probably eighth century so was this a verbal uh, passover of uh, the doctrines uh, yeah to a great degree it was verbal or what we call oral tradition but it's good oral tradition because it faithfully preserves the authentic gospel teaching, okay? And until it's written down, and you know from our subject this semester and last semester, that the books of the New Testament really don't exist until 25 to 50 years or 55 years after Jesus' death. And so the traditional teaching of the Christian faith was oral. It was by word of mouth until the apostolic generation gets old enough that they begin to die. And when that was perceived as likely, then there were various forces uh, that prevailed upon the early church leaders to put in writing on paper these apostolic teachings, these elements of the faith that had been entrusted to the saints. Get that in writing so that we don't lose it when you die. So yeah, a lot of oral tradition up until about this time, and then we get this explosion 
of Christian documents in the 50s and 60s of the first century. Okay, does that make sense, Pastor Nigel? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You want to do a follow up? Uh, that would be enough, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is a good reminder to us that although theology is adapted to different cultures and different times through what we call contextualization, what we do not find in theology is a reinvention of Christian theology that is geared to the times. No, the theology is anchored to the rock, and it must be so in order to be authentic Christian teaching. So if somebody comes along and says, um, I'm the Gentile son of God, and I am here to bring Christian faith to the Gentiles, and the New Testament doesn't say anything about that kind of thing, you can be pretty much certain that that claim is a false claim, and the person making the claim is a false teacher. Mm. That is an innovation. It is something that is not found in the New Testament. It's not part of the original faith that was entrusted to the saints, that there would come in the 20th century a guy by the name of Apollo Kivaloi. There's just no way that you can justify that from the New Testament. And of course, Kibaloi uses an unsound hermeneutic when he reads himself into passages in the Gospels that talk about the Son of God. He claims the passage is talking about him. Well, that's not possible because the original audience that read the Gospel of Mark or Matthew or Luke or John in the first century would never have suspected that this passage is talking about a 20th century Filipino by the name of Apollo Kibaloi. So there's an example of how exegesis provides control over the possible meanings of a passage. It cannot mean what it never meant. So it cannot mean that it refers to Apollo Kibaloi because it never originally would have meant that to the original audience or author. So this faith that's once uh, handed over or entrusted to the saints is very important reminder that we need to work hard to preserve what we now call orthodoxy. Orthodoxy and to shun heresy. To shun heresy. And of course, the heretics that produce the heresy. Okay, so this is one of the really important and unique features of the book of Jude, is that it has this um, exhortation to preserve the faith as it was established in the first century, to find great continuity in doing that. Okay, uh, a second very interesting thing about the, the book of Jude is if you tend uh, turn to the very end of the book, you'll find verses 24 and 25. One of the unique elements of this book is that it provides us with a very wonderful doxology that we often repeat at the end of a worship service in one of our churches. Hear what verse 24 says and 25. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault, with great joy, to the only God and our Savior, to be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. I can't tell you how many times I've ended a worship service by either reading or quoting those verses because they're a wonderful doxology and perhaps you've done the same thing that's the second 
unique feature about the book of Jude. A third thing, which is part of the message here, is that the book of Jude is the only book in the New Testament to quote from the intertestamental, pseudepigraphical, apocalyptic book of First Enoch. And you'll see that at the bottom of this page, number three. Jude is the only New Testament writer to cite an intertestamental non-canonical writing. Verses 14 and 15 are taken from 1 Enoch chapter 1, verse 9. Now, these words, in their context written by whoever produced 1 Enoch, those words there are not inspired. They're not in a canonical book. But when Jude picks up or borrows those words and puts them into his book, then they become inspired, not implying that all of Enoch was inspired at all. But by using these words in an inspired New Testament document, at least that small portion of the book of Enoch that Jude repeats, that becomes something we think of as inspired, even though its source was not. But this particular quotation fits the argument of Jude because the Enoch text is a statement of judgment against the ungodly, as we see in verses 4 and 15, which is the point Jude is making in verses 14 and 15. He's talking about these false teachers and how because of their false teaching, they are now deserving of judgment. And he compares them to the angels that, um, that, are, that were judged as described in the book of First Enoch. And the false teachers of Jude's day and time, they will receive a similar judgment to those angels of the ancient world. So it says in verse 14, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in an ungodly way and of all harsh words and ungodly uh, words, ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So the word that gets repeated there is ungodly ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. And that's exactly what the opponents in the book of Jude are. They're ungodly men. Uh, they're selfish and so forth. And so it just shows that Enoch has here the, the expectation of a future divine judgment against the ungodly. And, uh, and Jude believes that the uh, opponents in this letter are included within that body of people being judged. Okay, so um, that is the book of Jude. So we've covered 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and Jude tonight, and you've got the three handouts from that. I've uploaded on Google Classroom already the next assignment, which pertains to reading uh, in Carson and Moo, the chapters on 1 Peter, Second Peter and Jude. So that is the assignment for next week, <clears throat> which is a assignment that's very similar to what you've been doing all semester. The uh, only remaining thing that I need to speak to you about is the exegesis assignment. And I have uploaded that as well. And I've made specific instructions that I'm passing on to you. Um, the, perhaps the good news for, for each of you is that this is not a full exegesis paper uh, like was assigned last semester. And what I'm asking you to do is a rather limited exege exegetical exercise. And I want you to focus on chapter one, verse 20 of 2 Corinthians. And that passage says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us 
to the glory of God. What I want you to do is an exegesis of this, try to get out the original meaning of this passage, but to focus on two particular expressions in this verse. I want you to find out what Paul means when he uses the word promises. What promises are, would he be talking about? Is he talking about promises that the Roman emperor made to all the Roman citizens? Well, no. So if he's not talking about that, what is he talking about? So I want you to dig into that and find out the answer exegetically. Not what you want him to be saying by promises, not what you hope that he would be saying when he uses the word promises, but exegetically, what did Paul mean in this context when he uses the word promises? In addition, I want you to exegete the clause, they are yes in Christ. They are yes in Christ. And I've given you some uh, coaching as to how to go about doing this assignment. Uh, what I have not given you is a bunch of resources. And this has become somewhat problematic because we're not gathering together for this class on the campus of BTC CGST in Mandawi City. We're scattered uh, around Cebu Island and other islands. And for some of you, it's impossible to get into the library and to use those resources. So what I've done is I've shortened this up. So you're not writing an exegesis paper per se, but you are writing a research assignment that you will put on paper, or I should say digital paper, and you'll submit it to uh, Pastor Ryan and I for, for grading. So I've provided this um, document that has 12 points, numbered points, and I want you to read all of this very carefully before beginning the assignment. And <clears throat> to fulfill the expectations of this assignment and to do it successfully, you'll need to comply with what these instructions specify for this assignment. Um, it's due on May 11th, so you've got a month to accomplish it. It ends up being 25% of your grade. And uh, the paper that you turn in can be, oh, minimum of three pages. I would think that this could be done with no more than five pages. So three to five pages, but a minimum of three. Um, I do want you to use sources to help you to figure out what these terms mean. And I want you to document the sources that you use. So they can be paper sources, like books in the library, uh, but they can also be digital sources. And if you use digital sources, you need to give uh, a reference or a citation to the source for which you um, have found these words or ideas. So uh, if you do not have a copy of the CGST handbook, you're going to have to get a copy of it. Uh, let me know if you don't have a copy, I can email one to you. Um, so you, you need to use sources, but I'm not going to specify which ones because you don't all have access to the library. Normally, I would like to pick out a few commentaries in the library and ask you all to use those commentaries, commentaries that I know are good, that they're written by good scholars and they're exegetical in their methodology. But because most of you probably in the future will not be coming to our library to get resources as you prepare sermons, maybe it would be helpful to do some exploration on how to get this material using the internet. So I would encourage you, if you find good sources that are online, you could share them with other people in the class so that they can benefit from those course sources as well. Uh, I just do not want you to be uh, copying each other's work and paper and submitting the same thing. <clears throat> so do your work independently for yourself, submit your own paper, but you're free to share resources that you've 
you've uh, acquired in some way. So let me ask um, any questions about this exegesis assignment. Sir, I'm assuming, sir, question, sir. I'm assuming that uh, the reference list won't be the same as the reference list that uh, we were used to, or should we follow the, the guidelines in uh, the research guide? Yes, follow the research guide. Uh, those standards for CGST research papers still apply. Okay, sir. But if we are going to use uh, digital books, uh, we are we. I, I'm not sure how how it would apply. So, okay. So some books that you may find digital in digital form will actually be like PDFs or scans, in which case you have actual page numbers that you can use for citing what you're using, um, what is your resource. Now, there might be other uh, sources online that are just uh, blog sites or information sites, and they don't have page numbers because they were not published as books, you know, paper books. In that case, you'll have to cite the URL in order to tell me where you got this information. And the instructions in the handbook should give you some uh, advice how to cite a URL. And if it doesn't, then the book by um, uh, the, the research guide by, I got a brain freeze right at the moment. Um, Turabian, sorry, took me a few seconds to come up with that book. Uh, Kate Turabian, a research guide for uh, research papers, a guide for research papers. Uh, there's a lot in that book about how to cite all kinds of sources, whether it's a book, a journal, a dictionary, an encyclopedia, a website, uh, an interview, or even statistics. All of those things are covered in Turabian's book uh, about how to document um, your sources for a research paper. So if in doubt, you'll have to consult that book. <clears throat> that book is usually for sale in almost any national bookstore. So it's widely available. Other questions about the research assignment? Well, if any of you have any problems or questions about this assignment, um, I would encourage you to post them on either the Google Classroom site or in the uh, Facebook Messenger uh, chat thread that we have for this class. And um, I, I check the messages on Facebook more often than I check Google Classroom. So if you want to make sure that I see the question, put it, put it there on Facebook private messenger. Um, that would be the easiest way to get my attention if you end up having a question about this. No questions? No comments about this? <clears throat> Next, uh, also on Google Classroom, I uploaded two documents that will help you to deal with two peculiar uh, things that you find, one in 1 Peter and uh, another in 2 Peter, uh, peculiar issues that this uh, set of two books brings up. One of them is called the Tartarus Handout, and it helps you to understand what is Tartarus, where did it come from, where did the term come from? And the other is from 1 Peter, where it talks about Jesus preaching to spirits in prison. Those are two peculiar passages, and I've included 
handouts that you can refer to to help you to deal with that and have an understanding of that, an exegetical understanding uh, in case you might be preaching or teaching that, or if you're just curious about those two. <clears throat> I'm assuming that you don't have a huge personal library with lots of expensive commentaries that cover the whole New Testament. And so some of these peculiar problems that arise, uh, I can help you out with through the means of a handout. Okay, so I've drawn attention to the other things that are on the Google Classroom. Let me check here on my computer to see if there's anything that I've missed that I need to talk about today with you. It looks like I've covered everything. So um, we're, we're finished a little bit early today and I don't think any of you will complain about that. Um, but if I've missed something that I should have covered, let me know and I'll try to answer that um, on one of the digital platforms. So let me, let me pause and offer a concluding prayer for us and um, then we will then we'll go our own ways. Let's pray together. Lord, we are thankful for these special books, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and Jude. We recognize that they challenge us. They challenge us, first of all, to be willing to live through persecution and suffering. And by doing that, we follow your example. We pray, Lord, that when we are facing persecution, you'll give us the strength to endure it and to maintain our testimony through it. We pray also that you would help us, cause us to be good defenders of the faith that was once handed over to the church. That we would fight heresy when necessary. Lord, help us not to be just out there doing heresy hunting, but be wise and be patient and to be kind as we deal with those who may have wrong ideas in their mind and in their theology. Help us to be patient as we await for your second coming, as we're taught in Second Peter, that we would continually be doing the kinds of things you want us to do because we're obedient and we're faithful to our Lord and Master. So Lord, I thank you for this class of 19, and I pray that you would bless them as they work more and more toward the end of the semester with lots and lots of assignments that are due for this class and others, and they're due at the same time. I pray that you would provide for all of their needs. I pray that you would keep them healthy. I pray that you'd give them much fruit in their ministry in churches, in parachurch organizations, and even in their families. Lord, thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.